Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today's with great pleasure, my guest is Oren Kessler. Oren has recently published a book, 1936, discussing the Great Revolt and what, according to him, are the roots of a modern Middle Eastern conflict. 1936-1939, a very problematic historical period that I will deal with him later through the interview. But first things first, Oren, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Oren, first question. Can you tell us something about yourself, your background, and more importantly, about the origins of the book? Sure. I, I was born and raised uh, mostly in upstate New York. Uh, my parents are both from Tel Aviv, and um, I spent part of my childhood in Tel Aviv, but mostly, mostly in the U.S. Uh, I went to university in Canada, in Toronto. Um, did my master's here, here uh, in Israel, and then um, began a journalism career. Uh, I worked at Haaretz for several years, Haaretz English, uh, both on the, on, the, on the print and on the online. I was uh, Arab affairs correspondent at Jerusalem Post. Uh, and then I sort of shifted into uh, think tankery and I was think tanking in London and then uh, in DC uh, for several years. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then for the past four or five years, I've been uh, working on this book. Um, the, the, f- the genesis of this book is that uh, I guess for years I, I, I had wanted, I had dreamt of, of writing a book. And for some reason, I, uh, I, I decided that what the world needs is another book on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So, uh, so, um, but I quickly realized, or perhaps I already knew that it was an extremely saturated, uh, field and every aspect of the conflict seemed to have already been written about from 15 different angles, uh, until I lit upon this particular topic of, of the revolt and everything, uh, surrounding it. And I realized at at the time, and I still believe that this was a severely underexplored, underinvestigated, and extremely formative and and seminal and important uh, episode in the conflict that uh, had tended to be passed over or dealt with far too quickly, certainly in English. Um, and and I realized that there was no sort of general interest account of this. Uh, of this uh, of this revolt and, and and everything surrounding it uh, in English, and that's kind of the the gap that I set about to fill. I just want to add a few things here because I'm too kind of involved in this kind of research, and I must admit that at the very beginning I was a bit skeptical about your claim, <laughs> but I uh, I did some research too. I mean, in the sense that you you quote from books and articles of uh, individuals that are colleagues and friends, and. Uh, there is a point here to be made that is true that, in fact, other than perhaps uh, some uh, good material published on uh, specific uh, events or details, like there's some good work done on the Bedouins as part of the Great Arab Revolt or uh, some individuals indeed, but effectively uh, some sort of a meta-narrative or a grand narrative uh, about uh, the revolt itself and trying to take into account uh, all of the various uh, components is actually missing. And in a sense, your book does that job. Uh, but it will be also interesting to see that coming out from, you know, different sides and uh, perhaps adding uh, with other material. And yeah, that's that's a very good point. And I certainly wouldn't want to erase the work that has been done uh, on this. There's 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 very good academic work. There's I, I I still would suggest that there's not as much as there should be, but there there are academic works, a handful of them that have been dedicated to this revolt. Um, generally to a certain aspect of the revolt, as you suggest, whether it's the Bedouin, as you mentioned, or uh, there was a book recently by the British professor Matthew Hughes, a military history about the British counterinsurgency and very much a sort of traditional academic military history. Um, There have been two more or less general accounts in Hebrew. And then uh, in Arabic, uh, Professor Kabha, who I mentioned earlier, has done more than anyone to kind of fill the gap of, of uh, Arabic historiography. So I wouldn't want to suggest that, that I've, I've, this is completely virgin territory that no one's ever uh, gotten to. But I, I, I do think that I can, um, I can claim that I can assert that, that it is the first sort of, as you put it, meta-narrative or sort of general history uh, in English about this, about this revolt. Um, 
Uh, absolutely. And I was thinking while reading the book, also other, you know, uh, kind of works that have been written about, again, like a very specific parts. Uh, Lauren Bancom wrote about, for instance, the question of citizenship that emerged there. But on the other hand, I, I also realized that there are other aspects missing. For instance, you discuss uh, uh, briefly the question of also the intervention of other, uh, you know, foreign powers. And, uh, you know, from an Italian perspective, something that uh, I sort of uh, had in the making for quite some time to look also at the role of uh, fascism and, uh, you know, Mussolini himself in, you know, supporting quite interestingly both sides in different ways because, uh, you know, there's never like a clear-cut choice made by uh, foreign actors who to support who. Uh, but I found it interesting that, you know, your narrative was actually bringing uh, all of these uh, together. Let me move to, uh, um, you know, the next question. Now, before we delve into the details of the Arab Revolt and perhaps some of the stuff that we just uh, mentioned, I'm curious about the historical context. Uh, you know, most of the listeners may be familiar with it, but I was wondering if you can give us a sense of uh, what's going on in Palestine uh, before the uh, outbreak of the Great Arab Revolt in 1936. Sure. So, so as I as I mentioned earlier, the the sort of the the modern Zionist movement really begins in the late 19th century. Uh, of course, with with uh, Theodore Herzl and and and, and with, uh, organizes the first Zionist conference and, and Congress in 1897. But even before then, there's uh, Zionist immigration to the land, and then of course you've got the Balfour Declaration in 1917, in which uh, in which Britain expresses its uh, its support for a quote Jewish national home in Palestine, and of course. There, since that moment, there has been endless debate about what that means. What is a Jewish national home? What does it mean to be in Palestine rather than perhaps encompassing all of Palestine? What are the borders of Palestine? Uh, but that's the Balfour Declaration. That's 1917. And then um, a few years later, the, the, the League of Nations uh, enshrines that, that declaration of support for a Jewish national home in the mandate text, kind of the mandate constitution, if you like, and gives it to Britain. Which of course had 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 issued that Balfour Declaration, so uh, so Britain's sort of post World War One military occupation of of Palestine becomes a League of Nations mandate, and Britain is sort of ruling this country on behalf of the League of Nations, uh, and has agreed to facilitate uh, Zionist settlement, Jewish uh, settlement of of this land, while protecting the uh, religious. And and, uh, and and civil rights of the Arab population. That's essentially the the agreement, as it were. And then throughout the 1920s and 30s, um, there are ups and downs, of course, for for the Zionist movement. But it's an era of tremendous uh, building and investment, and certainly in um, well, let's 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 stick in the 1920s for a moment because there were three. Uh, outbursts of, of significant violence in the 1920s, which, uh, which we, we have to mention. That's 1920, 1921, and especially 1929. And uh, I can't, I've lost track of how many people, when I tell them the topic of my book, who say, oh, you mean Hebron? And I say, no, that was 1929. Uh, there, there are books on that already. And, and, and Hebron was, uh, was um, a horrific outburst of violence in which, in which some nearly 70 Jews were killed in, in one day in Hebron. And then, and then by the end of that week, about, about a, uh, 130 and, um, and a, a fairly similar number of Arabs killed by, by British uh, forces as well. Uh, that, that was a horrific outburst of violence, but it wasn't an uprising. It wasn't a sustained intifada, as we say these days. That, nothing like that had been seen until, uh, until 1936. Can you give us a short description um, of the main characters involved in this context? Because uh, one one interesting part of your narrative is that you're you're trying to uh, sort of discuss a number of individuals who played important roles in the revolt. Some also marginal, but you know, they, at some point they became relevant for for the discussion. And so, uh, you know, we, we may keep the, the the great mufti for later. But if you can just give us a sense of who's who in 1936 at the beginning of the revolt and, you know, also then 37, 38, and going up to the uh, end of this revolt in 1930, uh, 1939. 
Yeah, and I I I, I should add to that very quick uh, canned summary of of the um, of the early decades of the mandate that, of course, Zionist immigration was growing by leaps and bounds in the 1930s, and this is really kind of the context uh, the context that sort of leads to the backdrop of the revolt is that in the first half of the 1930s, the Jewish population of this country nearly doubles. Uh, these are really huge numbers. Um, it grows from, I, I believe, about 175,000 to, to, to maybe 350,000. And it's, uh, it's nearly one third of the population of the entire country. And in fact, in 1935, just before the revolt breaks out, you have immigration of 60,000 Jews in a single year. This is, of course, in the wake of Hitler rising to power in Germany and uh, anti-Semitic movements um, gaining strength around Europe, in, in Poland, in Hungary, in Romania. Um, so that's really the backdrop to all of this. And so in 1935, there is a man whose name may be familiar to some of your listeners, uh, is Adin al Qassam. And this was a, a, a preacher from originally from the Latakia area of Syria, kind of a local village preacher. And at a certain point in the 20s, he comes down to, well, he's wanted by the French and he, he, he comes down to Palestine, settles in Haifa, which is a booming town in large part because the Brits have made it uh, an imperial hub, a transport and logistics hub. Uh, by the 30s, they're building a huge port there. They're, they're building Palestine's primary port in Haifa to essentially to, to replace or to to overtake uh, Jaffa port, which is much more sort of uh, antiquated and ancient. Um, so in, in Haifa, the, there develops this, this sort of community of low-skilled um, workers, Arab workers, who are somehow affiliated with the port or, or, or who, have, who have streamed into Haifa from surrounding villages to take advantage of the opportunities there. And Qassam is preaching to them. And he's preaching, uh, he's preaching jihad against imperialism, against the British. And he tells them things like, you know, when the, when the, when the British officer comes and, uh, and, and presents his shoe for you to shine, you should take out a, a gun from your shoe box. Don't take out a brush. And, uh, and he's really um, spreading this, this message, essentially, of, 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 of resistance, of jihad against, uh, against the British above all, although there were also some uh, attacks in those early days by his followers, uh, against Jews, mainly he was, he was focused on the British. And in 1935, he is killed in, in a forest in, in northern Palestine by the British. And of course, he's kind of the, the proto-martyr. He's, he's really the first sort of famous uh, preacher, warrior, martyr in, 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 Pal in, the, in the Palestinian pantheon, if you like. And um, of course, his, his followers vow revenge and a few months after that, I guess about five months after that, in um, April 15th, on April 15th of 1936, they fired the first shots uh, of the revolt, but we can, we can get to that a bit later. Um, in terms of other sort of main characters, there's another, uh, and I should mention, since we, we mentioned Kassam's name, of course, Kassam has lent his name to the uh, armed wing of Hamas and to uh, Kassam rockets that, that Hamas fires on Israel. So it's, his name is still very much uh, in the news, and then another sort of main Arab character in these in these um, in these er in the early part of the revolt is a man named Fauzi al Kaoubchi, who your may whose name may also sound familiar uh, to those among your listeners who have who have read about this conflict because he reappears in 1948. Uh, Kaoubchi is a very colorful character, originally from Tripoli and Lebanon. He's a man who enjoys uh, whiskey. He's a man with a lively sense of humor. He's a man who serves, he's kind of a journeyman. He's kind of a military journeyman and he serves in a number, probably four or five different militaries or militia before he ends up in Palestine. And really uh, in the early months of the revolt really gives it a uh, kind of professionalism. He was an officer in the, in, in the Ottoman army as well. He gives it a professionalism uh, and a, court, a sort of mystique and a prestige that it, that it, uh, had lacked before he arrived when it was just sort of a, a grassroots, um, much more disorganized uprising. So those are those are the main um, 
sort of characters on, on the, the Palestinian, on the Arab side in the, in the beginning of the, in the, of the world. And what about on the other side? What about the Zionists? I mean, I, I was fascinated to, you know, understand better the, the rising figure of uh, David Ben-Gurion, for instance, but he's not alone, obviously, in this uh, period of time. Absolutely. He, he is, by this time, he's the undisputed leader of the Jews in Palestine, of the Yeshuv, as you say in Hebrew, the kind of pre-state Jewish uh, community. However, he's barely known outside of Palestine. This is something that we tend to forget. The, at this time, and really throughout the mandate, the, the, the face and the muscle of Zionism in the world is Chaim Weizmann, and uh, who's the head of the World Zionist Organization. Um, this, is, this is a man who, from, from the Balfour Declaration until, really, 1948, is, is the face uh, of Zionism. He's tremendously well-connected. Um, He's tremendously charismatic, according to almost every, anyone who, who meets him. Uh, he's extremely well-connected in British uh, elite circles. He had lived in the, U in the UK for many years. And, uh, you know, Israelis tend to remember Weizmann as the first president, but that was really the, uh, an epilogue to his career. That was, he was already an old man by that point. He was half blind by that point. But uh, he, th there's, there's really, he's, he's really uh, the central figure of, of um, you know international Zionism, if you like, in this uh, in this period, and 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 he's a fascinating character. Um, and then and then on the British side, we've got some some real uh, characters as well. And this is part of the reason that this topic drew me in so much is that as I as I researched it more and more, I was encountering figures like Winston Churchill. I was encountering figures like uh, Ord Wingate, um, and uh, and uh, so yeah, really on on not just you know, there are two, three sides to this triangle. There's the, the, the Arab side, the Jewish side, and the British side. And on all three, I tried to, uh, to focus in uh, on characters who, yeah, on, 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 on some very complex and compelling characters, including, as, as I think you alluded to earlier, uh, some characters who are not the most obvious necessarily to, uh, through whom to tell this story, particularly on the, on, on the Arab side. I, I spent a lot of time following a man named Musa Alami and another named George Antonius, um, who were, neither of whom was necessarily a central political leader. But in the case of Antonius, he was he was an intellectual. They were both Cambridge men, Antonius and Alami, and um, and uh, he kind of wrote the seminal book on 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 Arab nationalism during this period and kind of introduced it to the West. And you know, if we if we have time, we can we can discuss that a bit a bit more. But um, and then Musa Alami was just uh, I just found him a very fascinating, very compelling, very sympathetic character in many ways. Uh, this is a man who worked in the British administration for many years. Was very had had, had many British friends. He had many, he would meet often with leading Zionists. He would meet, he met a number of times with David Ben-Gurion and, and Ben-Gurion uh, respected Alami tremendously to, uh, to his dying day. Um, at the same time, he was, a, he was a committed Arab nationalist, Palestinian nationalist. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in his own way, and I don't want to give too much away here, but in his own pretty significant way, contributed to, to, to the Arab revolt. Uh, in ways that would have surprised a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of his British and Jewish friends and admirers. So there there, there really are some fascinating uh, characters in this in this time and place that I wanted to to um, introduce the reader to uh, in in as complex and deep a way as as possible, given the the constraints. I, I want to engage in a discussion here about uh, the so-called bloody day in Jaffa. And uh, particularly, what did it mean to the Palestinians, the Zionists, and what was the role of the British? Yeah, so the, 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 the Bloody Day in Jaffa occurred on April 19th, 1936. Um, and essentially, I mentioned earlier that it was, it, it, there, there, there are two different days on which you could, you could uh, identify the, the very beginning of this revolt, April 15th or April 19th, 1936. On April 15th, uh, as I mentioned, Qassam's acolytes uh, murdered two two Jews. Uh, they tried to murder three, but one survived uh, on the on the roads um, near Nablus. There was a, a, a 
elderly Greek Jewish poultry seller and his driver who were gunned down uh, on on the roads near near Nablus after after picking up some chickens from the Arab farmers there. So that was April 15th. And then four days later, we have what became known as the Bloody Day in Jaffa. And that was a day in which uh, 16, no fewer than 16 Jews were, were killed on the streets of Jaffa and, and South Tel Aviv. And basically a, a sort of um, just a sort of spontaneous outburst of of violence, there have been various rumors flying back and forth, as as tends to happen when these uh, when these um, when these outbursts occurred. Uh, but yeah, 16, 16 people um, sixteen people killed by the end of the day, mostly in a neighborhood which no longer exists called Manshia, uh, in and around the Hassan Bek Mosque. Now it's it's essentially a, a underneath a parking lot over there by the beach. Uh, but um, ex an extremely bloody day, and it was obviously quite shocking for the the Jewish community, as you can imagine, uh, and for the for the Brits who immediately implemented a curfew and um, uh, and tried to rush over some troops. Uh, for the for the for the Arab side, I think it was it was significant more than anything as the opening shot of the revolt, and in the subsequent days. You had, in fact, the day after, you had Arab notables in Nablus, which has always been sort of a center of Palestinian nationalism, uh, declaring the formation of a national committee or a patriotic committee. And then just a few days later, um, these began sort of springing up across the country in the various towns and villages. And then uh, and then really within days, Hajamin, the Grand Mufti, declares uh, something called the Arab Higher Committee, with him at the top of it, which is essentially um, sort of the 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 umbrella group of all of these national committees. He kind of declares himself the, the 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 leader of this revolt, as it were. Essentially, you know, he he hadn't started the revolt by any means. In that in that sense, there's there's some parallels to the, the first Intifada of the 1980s, where. It kind of it's a it's a grassroots uprising that then the political leadership rushes to kind of uh, grab hold to grab uh, grab hold of and uh, and 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 and, uh, and claim. So essentially, Haj Amin declares this Arab national or Arab higher committee rather and makes three major demands, namely the complete stoppage of Jewish immigration, a complete ban on land sales from Arabs to Jews, and the establishment of a legislature that would reflect the country's demographics as they were at that time, namely a, a strong Arab majority. Uh, so those were the demands. And uh, very importantly, uh, a general strike was called, which ended up lasting six months, which even to this day, I believe, is one of the longest general strikes anywhere. Uh, in, and essentially, the Essentially, Arab residents of Palestine, uh, the vast majority of them, simply refused to work with the British, with the Jews in any way, shape or form uh, until these three demands were met. I'm curious about something, and probably this ties uh, with the methodology of the book or the way you look at uh, these events. Um, obviously, from our point of view, we may almost saying that it was inevitable that this revolt would move forward uh, in 37 and 38. Well, in other words, that's sort of, a, you know, it was unstoppable. But given the context, do you think there was a chance to kind of stop what was happening? So events to unfold in that direction, maybe other direction would have been possible. So I think to, to a certain extent, um, to a certain extent, it's always been, in a way, a zero-sum game. And what I mean by that is that from the beginning, the Zionist movement was aiming for a majority. And from the beginning, uh, the, the, the Arab nationalist movement in Palestine was very conscious of that fact and was very much determined to keep as much of a majority as it could. So either side, there, there, there's really there's no way to split that that baby, and 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 several people tried. Uh, Herbert Samuel, the first commissioner of Palestine, who was a, a Jew and a, and a Zionist uh, in his way, uh, 
tried to, and, or people like uh, Judah Magnus, the head of the Hebrew University, tried to sort of convince their fellow Jews that perhaps if they would give up their ambition of reaching a majority and they would agree to remain at most 35 or 40 percent, then perhaps there could be some kind of modus vivendi. But the other than some fairly fringe sort of peacenik movements among the Jews, the, the, the main, mainstream Zionism was, was, was always, always had its eye on a Jewish majority. There were questions about how long that might take and in what form that may take, whether a Jewish state or perhaps just a long-term British mandate in which the Jews would, would, would continue to grow in numbers. But that was always, uh, that was always the goal. Uh, among other things, was was a Jewish majority, and I and I I just don't see how now or back then you can uh, you can split that difference. Neither side would have been happy with fifty uh, fifty. I think we can we can uh, conclude. And that brings me to the next step. Um, when you discuss uh, the so called two state solution, so in other words, the partition of Palestine. Now. While meeting the Peel Commission, which came up with a plan to partition Palestine, and partition was not uh, uh, a new idea. In fact, the British were already working on the partition, of course, as they did uh, already in Ireland before, uh, obviously then to happen in India. So the whole idea is not a new concept. And uh, I had the feeling that uh, Chaim Weizmann looked like he was playing a sort of game. On one hand, telling the British, well, the Zionists don't want a state, but on the other hand, really hoping for the partition of Palestine so that a state would eventually emerge. And on the other side, Haj al-Amin Husseini was quite vocal against the Zionists, but actually looked like more uh, in less intransigent towards the British. In a sense, he was kind of playing a game uh, too. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's what you said is, is absolutely correct. Uh, Weizmann and Ben Gurion, I would add, both pretended that they that uh, you know that they were kind of lukewarm on this idea of partition and well maybe but it's you know um, it's not it's it's not remotely what we actually want but maybe since we're, you know we're, we're so reasonable that maybe we would maybe we'd consider it let, us, let let's think it over let us let us have a think uh, but you know in private they were both ecstatic I mean you can you can um, you can look through Ben Gurion's Memoirs. You can you can look through the recollections of people who spoke with Weizmann at the time, and and both of them were euphoric at this idea of a Jewish state. And even though, as you mentioned, the the concept of partition per se certainly preceded uh, this this particular commission, there, the, the other places had been partitioned. But the the, the notion of partitioning Palestine, you know. Western Palestine, namely between the the Jordan River and uh, and the Mediterranean, that hadn't been floated in any kind of official capacity uh, before this point. Um, there had been very there had been sort of some tentative ideas about it, or there had been ideas of ver of cantons of splitting up the Palestine mandate into various cantons. But the idea of what the commissioners call a clean cut is uh is new to the, this idea of a two-state solution and dividing this very small land without any clear geographic divisions in it uh dividing that into two states uh, really has its origin in uh in in this particular commission the peel uh commission now in terms of of hajj amin essentially hajj amin al husseini um Demands or, or instructs the, uh, the, the 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 Palestinian the, the Arabs of Palestine not to cooperate with this commission in any way, shape, or form. He instructs, uh, commands the people to um, and his underlings to boycott the commission in uh, completely until the very end of the commission, until they're about to pack up and leave, and he thinks better of it. He comes under quite a bit of pressure from. Uh, from the Emir Abdullah in Transjordan and from and from from powerful and influential Arabs both within and outside of Palestine to reconsider. And so he says, okay, you know what? Uh, we will testify. And um, and he himself is the first Arab in Palestine to testify. Now I'm not sure I would I'm not sure I would necessarily agree that he comes off as 
less intransigent um, when, when talking to the British. I think he, he simply realized that it was in his interest, he belatedly realized that it was, it was in his interest that the Arab case, that his own case and the Arab case be heard by this commission because the, the commission was meeting dozens of Jews who were extremely well, the Zionist movement was extremely well organized and had a very well oiled um, public relations apparatus, we, we, we could say. They would even travel around the country with, with some of the commissioners and, and show them the, the kibbutzim and show them all of these, uh, these great achievements that, that Zionism uh, had, had, had uh, under its belt. Uh, and the, the, the Jewish and the Zionist case was, was, was being presented to the commissioners day in, day out. And uh, again, he, related, he, he realized belatedly, as he tended to do, that it was simply not in the Arab interest to not be heard. But when he actually sat down and testified, his, his testimony was quite, um, was quite uncompromising. He didn't really, um, he didn't really move or budge from any of the positions he had held in, in, in previous years. He essentially said, these are my, my, my demands. These are my three demands. And, 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 and that's it. Um, and, and, and his control over the Arab population was such that nobody dared uh, have any contact with the commission until he gave the green light. And then he testified and several people, uh, several other leading Arabs testified afterwards. Let me ask you something about uh, uh, the Peel Commission. In a nutshell, what did the Peel Commission report look like? And uh, how did Arab and Jews react? So it's a, it's a 400 page document. But it's actually a, a very good read. It's it's very well written. It's uh, you know I read several of the, the the British loved sending commissions and uh, and they sent several throughout the mandate and I read several of them and this one is by far the best read. Um, there's there's a lot of history. There's a lot of context. It's uh, it moves along. It's got it's got a good pace. Uh, there's a lot of detail. Um, but of course it's it's mainly remembered for the last I think. 10 pages, maybe 15, in which almost as a very quick epilogue uh, or afterward, they say, oh, by the way, uh, here's an idea. You could, uh, <laughs> you could, you could, uh, you could partition the land. Uh, this is, this is, this is essentially the best uh, we could come up with. We're not really going to get into too many details, but here's a map that we've drawn up. Here are a few ideas of how it could happen. Uh, good luck. That's I'm obviously <laughs> that's obviously a very liberal paraphrase, but uh, it's not that far off. Uh, and um, so they basically, in the conclusion, they they uh, they they conclude they assert that an irrepressible conflict has has developed between two national movements in a in a very small country. That there's no common denominator between them, whether in language, in religion, in mentality, in aspirations. And really, that the only solution is is the clean cut, um, and uh, and that they can see no other way out. And and then again, and then they sketch out that that potential solution very briefly, and essentially recommend that if if the government adopts this uh, proposal, that they should send out uh, another committee to figure out how to do it. Uh, the end. That's that's a, that's uh, that's. Um, that's kind of the gist of the of of the recommendations. So, really fascinating document, primarily remembered for partition. I want to take you outside uh, Palestine. Your narrative intertwines uh, events in Palestine, but also uh, events that are occurring in Europe, and it's kind of like mixing them together. So, can you tell us a little bit more about the unfolding history in Europe and how did this influence? Uh, events in Palestine. Absolutely, and I and I and I realized that I, I I forgot to to answer part of your question, which is how the how the Peel report was received, um, and really the the, the Weizmann and Ben Gurion continued to kind of to to play act a little bit in the sense more than a little bit in the sense that they they kind of pretended to be to to be lukewarm and unenthusiastic about it. Um, but they were all they were all in. They were completely in, uh, in favor of it, and there was a very contentious Zionist Congress that year in uh, in Zurich, uh, 
Zurich, I believe, uh, in this is 1937 already, in which there's a very heated debate about whether to accept this or not. And some some leading Zionists, not not the two that I just mentioned, but some some others, uh, Menachem Musishkin, for example, and and others, Yitzhak Tabenkin, who were very much on the um, who themselves, uh, particularly Tabenkin, was very much on the Zionist left. Uh, and yet they thought this was a betrayal, this is unacceptable, or this was unworkable, and they fiercely opposed it. But in the end, uh, the, the, the Zionist Congress uh, approved it by not a huge margin, but they did approve it. And, um, and the Zionist movement, kind of the, the mainstream Zionist movement, gave their approval to this plan. I should mention that uh, there was, and we haven't discussed this yet, but there was a an alternative Zionist movement, the the right wing revisionist uh, movement of Vladimir Jabotinsky, as represented by groups like um, the youth the youth movement Beitar and the militia, the Irgun or the Etzel, uh, in English the the national military organization, the Irgun, which uh, completely rejected it, and 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 they said uh, they said that this was. This was a complete betrayal. Uh, the entire the entire land of Israel belongs to the Jews, including, by the way, uh, parts east of the Jordan, which the which the British had given to to to, uh, to uh, the Emir Abdullah when they created Transjordan in 1921. And this is a, this is an awful betrayal, and no way. Uh, so that was on the Jewish side. Uh, on the Arab side, of course, Hajamin rejected it uh, out of hand. Um, and uh, and he wasn't alone. It, it, there were there were very few prominent Arabs who were excited about the prospect of a Jewish state, no matter how small uh, it would be. Uh, the one exception being uh, Amir Abdullah in in Transjordan. This is a uh, uh, a member of the Hashemite dynasty, uh, which for 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 a long time ruled Mecca, but but no longer. They've been pushed out by the by the Saud dynasty. And um, this is the, the the brother of Faisal, the famous Faisal, who who. Uh, along with Lawrence of Arabia, launched the Arab Revolt in World War I. But uh, the Emir Abdullah always felt that Transjordan was not big enough for his ambitions. He always had an eye on Jerusalem, or perhaps Damascus, or perhaps Baghdad. Uh, and so he very much liked the idea, which is floated in the partition, <coughs> excuse me, which is floated in the, uh, in the Peel Report, which is that the Arab state should be in some kind of union with Transjordan. So he viewed that as an opportunity to expand his rather poor, sparsely populated desert realm. But other than him, it was uh, almost complete rejection on, on, on the Arab side. Uh, now, to, to, to answer your, your, your second question about the, the European context, um, it is true that the, the, uh, the book, the, the structure of the book is, uh, one of the reviewers called it a, uh, a mosaic history, and I, I, I take that as a compliment. I, I think I was somewhat inspired by by the the historian Tom Segev in his book One Palestine Complete, which I I think is just a masterwork in terms of storytelling, um, in the sense that uh, that uh, he 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 jumps around uh, a bit. He'll have maybe five or ten pages on a certain time or place, and then take you somewhere else to a different time or place. And then bring you back, and and uh, and, and and somehow it works. So, I, in a, in a sense, I, I, I tried to do that um, as well with this book because there is there is really no, I don't think there's you can separate the European situation from the Palestine situation. As as I mentioned, the 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 Jews of Europe could feel the walls closing in. That's not to say that most of them uh, knew that that genocide was on the horizon, but they could see. What was happening in Germany? This was already um, after Germany had uh, had instituted all kinds of anti-Jewish measures and um, all kinds of essentially made the Jews of Germany non-citizens. Um, there had already been uh, you know boycotts of Jewish businesses and and uh, all kinds of uh, terrible things in Germany and and in other um, in other European countries. So you really had, um, you know, this is a period in which you have the Munich crisis. This is the period of the Anschluss of Austria. Um, you know, this is when Hitler uh, you know, occupies the Sudetenland. And all of this is intimately 
tied both in terms of uh, the Jews realizing that things are getting very, very bad in Europe and needing a place to go. And by the way, the U.S. was essentially closed since, since the 1924 Immigration Act. The U.S. wasn't a possibility. So Palestine was essentially almost the only option in the world. This is also the period of the Evian Conference of 1938, in which an attempt was made, led by President Roosevelt, uh, to find some kind of solution for the persecuted Jews of Europe. And historians have debated how sincere the attempt was, but at least uh, this, this conference was called. And with the exception of Domin the Dominican Republic, uh, which offered to take in a few thousand Jews, there was essentially no country uh, that was willing to accept Jews in any kind of significant uh, numbers. And so uh, that's, that's in terms of Jewish immigration, but also in terms of Britain's military uh, capabilities. I mean, the British were, were extremely worried that a second world war was on the horizon, and therefore they don't have the resources and the men to send to Palestine to deal with the Arab revolt. So what did they do? They ended up arming and training in massive quantities, the Jews. And this is something they had resisted doing for years, despite repeated Zionist uh, requests, shall we say, or even demands, uh, requests, let's say, to, uh, to, to let, to let uh, the Jews help the British secure the country and requests by the Jews for arms so that they could protect themselves. The British had been very cold to all to those requests in the past, but now they realized that it's a much more feasible proposition to massively arm and train Jews than to bring over British forces who are needed in Europe, at least until the Munich crisis was uh, resolved, however temporarily. And so this is another extremely important byproduct of, of the revolt is that you have the premier military in the world at this point, the British, the British army, uh, arming and training Jews to the tune of 15, 20,000 of them. Um, and this is really the beginning of the, of the transformation of the Haganah, which was a technically illegal, but essentially um, tolerated Jewish self-defense organization or militia. Uh, it's the beginning of the transformation of Haganah from a, basically a glorified night watchman's unit into the seed of the IDF, the Israeli army. You, you already tackled a few things that I wanted to ask you, but perhaps you can add a little bit more about the significance of a, a specific event, which I found very important uh, in the book. And that, that was the execution of Shlomo Ben, Yo, ben Yosef, who was a member of the revisionist, uh, you know, shall we say, right-wing uh, movement, Beitar. And, and perhaps, and you already mentioned a few details, can tell us something a little bit more about these uh, uh, paramilitary forces, uh, not just the uh, Haganah, but also the Irgun, for instance, and maybe a little bit about their differences. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Shlomo Ben Yosef was a 25-year-old, uh, new, relatively new immigrant from Poland. He was a member of uh, a group called Beitar, a youth movement that was affiliated with um, or whose leader was Vladimir Jabotinsky, who is another fascinating character who, who is uh, fairly central to my, my book as well. He was uh, ex an extremely talented writer and thinker. He was in, in another life and another set of circumstances. He may have been a great Russian writer, uh, but he, um, he was the, the, the ideologue, the, 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 the leading light of revisionist Zionism, which uh, in the mid twenties decided, uh, Jabotinsky decided in the mid twenties that, um, that the mainstream Zionist movement was not, was, was too lax in its demands, was too eager to accommodate the British and that what was needed was a Jewish state, um, uh, and on both sides of the Jordan. Um, and that he, he essentially, he, he essentially claimed that the mainstream Zionists led by Ben-Gurion and Weizmann were also in the back of their minds thinking about a Jewish state. They just didn't dare say so. Whereas he was coming out and saying quite plainly what the goal was. And uh, where the, whereas the mainstream Zionist leadership th through most of the revolt, 
uh, uh, through all of it, arguably, but uh, there were some cracks towards the end. Uh, throughout the revolt, clung, clung to this idea of, in Hebrew, you say havlaga, which is self-restraint. And the, 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 the mainstream Zionists believed that if they could show the British that they were responsible, that they were, that they were sort of uh, absorbing these, these blows and these, the, 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 the death and the murder of their own people without retaliating, uh, that they could be, that they were responsible political actors and that they could be trusted with weapons. And it worked like a, like a charm. And that's without, without that, the British would not have, have armed and trained them in such numbers. The Irgun, uh, which uh, in Hebrew, it's Irgun Tzvai Leomi, the National Military Organization. This is Jabotinsky's r- sort of rival dissident right-wing militia, which had a very different view, which is much closer to an eye for an eye. And it's in this period that we see the, the, the rise of, of, of Jewish terrorism. I don't think there's another way to put it. And I didn't realize this. I didn't really know about this at all until I started researching this book. But uh, this is the period in which uh, the Irgun, again and again, literally dozens of times, uh, targets Arab civilians. They, they're, they're laying bombs in the, in the vegetable market in Haifa, and they're bombing an Arab-owned cinema in Jerusalem. Uh, this is... Um, there's, there's, there's no other way really to describe it than terrorism. This isn't, this wasn't uh, going after, you know, Arab armed groups to try to, to try to, uh, you know, for, for, for in, in the interest of a targeted assassination or something. These were, these were attacks on civilians in order to show that Jewish blood had a cost, and to show, and in an attempt to deter, um, to deter Arab attacks on Jews. Uh, so essentially, Shlomo Ben Yosef is a young Beitar member, and there were many links between Be- Beitar, the, the youth movement, and Yergun, the, the, the militia. And uh, he and a couple of friends um, it, essentially up in Rosh Pina in northern Palestine, northern Israel today, um, took aim. They, they, they obtained some, some handguns and took aim at an Arab bus. And the whole thing was planned terribly, and they missed the bus essentially completely and nothing, the bus kept on kept on driving um, and yet they uh, they they hid in the bushes somewhere and they were found by British forces and uh, Ben Yosef's two accomplices uh, if you like essentially um, essentially admitted what they had done and um, one of them went on to plead insanity, and they 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 found ways to to get out of any real punishment. They were they were minors, and they basically the, the the case went to trial, and they found all kinds of one of the one of them pretended to be younger than he was, and they found various ways to kind of get out of any uh, certainly out of capital punishment or any kind of really severe punishment. Ben Yosef, by contrast, said he decided that he was going to go to the gallows. He was going to show that the Jews of of today, of, of 1938, don't fear death. Uh, and that's what he did. He resisted all attempts uh, for clemency. Jabotinsky was working furiously to try to get some kind of clemency. Uh, and he simply accepted his fate. He even sought out uh, his, that, that, that fate and went up to the gallows singing Hatikva, the Zionist anthem, as well as the, the, the Beitar anthem and long live Jabotinsky. So Ben Yosef really became the first Jew executed by the authorities in this country, probably in 2000 years. And, um, and so it was, it was quite a tragic thing for many, for many, many Jews here. Um, ben Gurion thought it was ridiculous that, 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 uh, that Ben Yosef did something stupid and he shouldn't be turned into a martyr. Both his attack was stupid and going to the gallows, I think he probably thought was was unnecessary. Um, but um, but it just goes to show, I think, the the, the different mindsets and the different um, visions that the that the Haganah and the mainstream Zionists had about the way forward versus uh, the Irgun and the Jabotinskyite wing of of the Zionist movement. I want to move to talk about. Uh 
a very controversial figure, one that we mentioned several times, and he's certainly known uh, in many circles and certainly in Israel, mostly because of the infamous picture that was taken of uh, uh, Ajal Amin Hussein and uh, Adolf Hitler. But obviously there's more to that picture. And so I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about his role in the revolt, and perhaps you can... Uh, perhaps discuss Ajal Amin in relation to the other key figures that you already mentioned, David Ben-Gurion, but also on the British side or the Wingate. So there's, so Haj Amin al-Husseini, uh, the Grand Mufti since, since the early 20s, uh, and in 19, essentially the, you, you can split up the revolt into two phases, really. You have the first six month phase of, of, of the revolt and the, and the general strike. Uh, at which point the 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 British essentially uh, agree to call this royal commission uh, to look into the Palestine question, and then and then kind of the Arab leadership uh, agrees to uh, suspend the revolt as long as the, the 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 commission is 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 examining the question. So you have a lull there after six months, and then you have the publication of the Peel report. And then, uh, which of course was was rejected by Haj Amin. And then, in late 1937, you have the assassination of Louis Andrews, who was the acting commissioner of the Galilee. He was assassinated as he went to church on his birthday in Nazareth. And this was by far the highest level uh, British official to have been killed in, in in Palestine, really since since the British arrived. And when that happens, the British essentially decide that that all bets are off. And if they had if they had kind of dealt with the revolt with a comparatively light hand, of course that's debatable, but with a comparatively light hand until that point, now they were getting serious. And the Mufti understood that. The Mufti at this point flees to the Temple Mount, to the Haram Sharif where he believes correctly the British won't dare offend, offend Muslim sensibilities by storming the place. And then one night, uh, under the cover of darkness, he flees, and there are conflicting reports about whether he flees dressed as a woman or as a Bedouin, but he flees uh, Jerusalem and uh, ends up outside of Beirut in Lebanon. And, that, and, and, and of course... Uh, the question then is, what was he doing from 1937 to 1939 uh, when when the revolt is finally brought to a close? What was what was he doing there? Was he just biding his time, or was he uh, directing the revolt from afar? And I think I think it was fairly the, the Mufti was very very canny. He was very very clever. Um, he left almost no paper trail. There was no smoking gun that said the Mufti is leading this revolt. Uh, and I don't think anyone really thinks he was micromanaging every attack uh, or, or, or even any attacks, really. But I, I do think that it was fairly clear to the British, to the Jews who had their own nascent uh, intelligent apparatus at this point, and, and indeed to the Arabs, that it was the Mufti who was guiding the revolt a, 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 along its main lines. There, there are, there are. I mean, in the in the archival record. Uh, you know, I found I found documents from the Palestine police that said things like he kept, quote, quote the entire rebel movement under his thumb. Uh, there is an MI5 report that that said that the Mufti controls the movement along its main path. Uh, you know, the, the, the two colonial secretaries of this period, uh, Ormsby Gore and, and Malcolm McDonald, both were, were convinced that, that the Mufti is is the one who's ultimately uh, behind Funding and arming and 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 just um, motivating these uh, these these armed groups to continue uh, their attacks and even in 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 after he flees the country he there's a there's a group set up in Damascus called the Central Committee for the National Jihad and so you can see the kind of Islamic quite strong Islamic uh, overtones there already. Uh, and, and this is led by a guy named Izzat uh, Darwaza, who's a, a nablus intellectual, who's not technically affiliated with the Mufti, but it's kind of known to everyone that uh, this office in Damascus is essentially uh, serving as a way station for the Mufti's orders to go to the armed bands. So this, this, uh, 
this group, I mean, the group was fairly open about its aims, which were, which were to, to, to support these armed groups, but it was fairly clear to everyone that it, that it was the Mufti who was calling the shots through this Damascus, uh, office. Um, and then later on this, 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 this office found something called the central committee, uh, it's called the uh, central bureau of the Arab revolt, which essentially, uh, nominates two militant leaders to be the kind of rotating heads of the, of the revolt. And again, this is all ascend. These are all essentially the Mufti's men who are, uh, who are in charge of these, uh, these organizations. So again, there's, there's no smoking gun. Uh, I, I, I would say because the Mufti was too smart for that, but I don't think, um, I, I, I think it would be hard to argue that, um, that he was not just the symbolic, but also the practical, uh, force behind uh, much of the revolt. And, and, and that includes, uh, it's important to say, not just the tax on the British or on the Jews, but that includes um, a large number of, of violent actions against Arabs who are considered insufficiently committed to the cause. So that's, you know, actual traitors, that's perceived traitors, that's just enemies of, 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 of the perceived enemies of the Mufti. Um, and there were quite a few uh, prominent and not so prominent Arabs who, who ended up uh, assassinated for being considered enemies of the revolt slash the Mufti, which in, in the Mufti's eyes tended to be kind of one in, the, one in the same. He tended to kind of identify himself with Palestine. And if you were an enemy of, of a perceived enemy of him, you were an enemy of, of, of the people and the nation. I have a couple of more questions, and but I think they're very important. And one is about... Uh, um, 1938 and 1939. I was wondering if you can summarize for us a little bit the events and also the price that was paid by the communities involved, both the Arabs, the Jews, and indeed the British. Yeah, uh, these are really the, the, the critical years of, of the revolt. Um, the, the peak of the revolt is in, is in mid-1938. Um, and it's after the Munich crisis is uh, averted temporarily by the Chamberlain government um, that, or resolved that uh, the British are able to send large numbers of, of forces to Palestine. And they do. They send two divisions, which is you know, 25,000 men. Um, this, is, you know, this, is the great, this is the largest uh, uprising against the British Empire in the interwar years. Um, and they and so they flood the country with 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 troops. Um, the police are also very active, but uh, and um, and this is also the period of, of Ord Wingate and the Special Night Squads. And we can uh, perhaps I'll, I'll I'll mention that a bit later as well. And um, but uh, the British, uh, it's it's really no holds barred almost at this point. Um, there are emergency regulations that are that are enacted or, or uh, invoked. And this is where you see wide scale home demolitions. You see thousands of homes demolished, about 2000 probably. You see a uh, collective punishment in which, and these were, these were um, uh, Matthew Hughes, who I mentioned earlier, uh, puts it well when he says, he writes that lawlessness was the law. Basically, according to the emergency regulations that were in place, the British were allowed to do these things that they were that they were doing. So collective punishment. Uh, you know, if a if a British convoy was attacked on the road next to a certain village, the British would ascend, would go to that village and tell the Mukhtar, the, the the headman of that village, okay, produce whoever did this, whoever did this, or else the entire village is guilty. Um, and uh, you know, there were there were there were. Th- there were a number of uh, atrocities as well during this period. That I don't think there's another way to put it uh, that, uh, that we can get into if, if, if you like. But there's there were the a, a lot of the uh, administrative detention, for example, uh, you know, detention without uh, without cause, essentially without charges, is something that that basically uh, hails from this period. And so a lot of the a lot of the um, uh, I mean, the cover of my book shows Old Jaffa uh, in a state of destruction. You know, a huge swath of Old Jaffa was basically destroyed. This was actually earlier in 1936, uh, in order to give the British access uh, to to um, sources of, of terrorism in their in their view. So essentially, you have 
wide scale, large scale, heavy handed um, military operations, counterinsurgency operations, demolitions, mass arrests. Uh, you have, you know, you have about a hundred Arabs hanged in this in this period. You have, uh, you know, in total at least five thousand, perhaps ten thousand uh, Arabs killed. Uh, it's obviously a matter of, of debate or uncertainty about how many of those were, were killed by their by their fellow Arabs rather than by the British. Uh, but but you have a, a very serious um, military operation that is is uh, that's pursuing collective punishment. That's uh, that's also uh, hunting down particular rebel leaders quite successfully. And uh, you've got. You know, tens of thousands of, of of Arabs fleeing the country at this point. This is really the first wave of of refugees outside of the country. You have something like I, I think it's something like thirty thousand Palestinians in Beirut alone. So you have the kind of the flight of the elite, which is kind of a uh, a precursor or a preview of nineteen forty eight. Um, so all of this really reaches ahead uh, in nineteen thirty eight. And the revolt is fairly successfully uh, weakened. It's really dealt uh, a death blow. Um, and then in 1939, once the revolt is kind of uh, on the ropes almost, the British call the, the something called the St. James Conference in London, in which they essentially decide, okay, it looks like a World War is coming and we need to fundamentally appease, and this is the word that they use, this is of course the era of appeasement, we need to fundamentally appease Arab opinion because uh, we need Arab and Muslim opinion on our side in the coming war. Um, so I don't know if you want me to get into that conference uh, right now, but the, essentially uh, there's a political decision that's made, which is that the British need to go as far as they possibly can in the direction of, of Palestinian Arab demands. And that's what leads to the infamous white paper of 1939. Which is the McDonald white paper. And that's where I wanted to go and ask about it. Um, because the, the McDonald white paper essentially um, at least seemed to stop Jewish immigration towards Palestine and effectively acknowledge the grievances of the Arabs. However, and I found this very, very interesting, in the epilogue of the book, you say, effectively, the Arabs did not lose the war in 1948 and 49, but the, the war was lost 10 years earlier, so with the end of the Arab revolt, which looks like some sort of a, a paradox because the, the McDonald papers suggest that well, the Arabs won uh, at the end of the Arab revolt, but it doesn't look like this was the case. So I was wondering if you can speak about this, and perhaps you can also include in this discussion the larger, the larger impact of World War II. As we discuss this, this the St. James uh, Conference leads leads essentially to, to the White Paper, which severely curtails Jewish immigration, uh, and then essentially says after a number of years. Um, Palestine will get its independence, and it, and and if it's clear to everyone that that means independence with an Arab majority, and it's that it's de facto an Arab state. This is essentially a uh, a walk back from the Balfour Declaration. That's how almost everyone sees it. Certainly, the Jews see it that way. That the the commitments made uh, under the Balfour Declaration are no longer valid, and. Um, and there's a discussion in in Arab circles and in the Mufti circles about what about what to do. And um, you know there are there are um, celebrations on the streets of Nablus and, and Nazareth where the Arabs basically say we've we we've won. They said this revolt that we've that we've given so much blood and treasure to has has has, has you know, it's yielded fruit. We've 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 finally. Um, we finally gotten what we wanted, uh, uh, and so there are quite a number of, of prominent Arabs who are in support of uh, of, ex of accepting of embracing this this white paper. Of course, it doesn't meet all of their demands. Of course, they would prefer that a, a third of the country not be uh, comprised of Jews. And yet, uh, it's very many influential Arabs think that it's the best they can hope for. Uh, the Mufti, as you can probably predict, uh, rejects it. 
And he's really the only, uh, against almost all advice, he, he, he rejects this white paper as not going uh, far enough. Um, so in that sense, it's, 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 a, it's a win and it's a victory in the sense that they were offered uh, all of these concessions. And the British still intended to, you know, it's not like because the Mufti rejected it that they said, okay, the, the, the offer is off the table. The idea, the British offer was, the British idea was essentially we're going to present these concessions in order to appease Arab and Muslim opinion in Palestine and outside of it in the face of the coming war. Uh, and so, of course, this is seen as a huge betrayal uh, by the Jews, and yet Ben Gurion comes up with his famous formula that once World War II breaks out, uh, that we shall uh, fight the war as if there's no white paper, fight the white paper as if there's no war, and fight the war as if there's no white paper. There's different versions of it. Some people say we shall fight uh, Hitler as if there's no white paper, we shall fight the white paper as if there's no Hitler. Uh, and so the kind of final reckoning between, between the Jews and the British is put off, uh, for those years of, of World War II. And then it reemerges after World War II. And essentially the British face a Jewish revolt, uh, after World War II, uh, which, um, in many ways was, uh, was, was more, more violent and deadly than the, than the Arab revolt, uh, of the, of the previous decade. But of course, the key year here is, is 1948. Uh, and um, yeah, you mentioned uh, the, the part of my book, the epilogue, in which I discussed that uh, essentially the, the Palestinian Arabs had lost, the, the, the Arabs of this country had lost the country uh, a decade beforehand. And, and I have to give credit where due. This is not, this is something that uh, the, 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 his, the Palestinian American Rashid Khalidi has also written. He refers to uh, the, the the Nakba of 1947, 48, 49 as um, uh, a postlude, a tragic epilogue of the events of 1936 to 39, because the Palestinian social, not just the social fabric, but the, the it's uh, the Palestinians' um, military capabilities. They were they're just. Um, relations between families, uh, the entire social fabric was torn. You had thousands of, of men killed. You had thousands of uh, thousands more in exile. You had um, thousands of weapons uh, confiscated. You had um, uh, just an enormous amount of bad blood within, within the community. Uh, between between rival families and such, so it, it, on every uh, economically completely gutted. I mean, the the the, the Arab uh, boycott of of Jewish businesses and of the British economy was a huge blow economically, and and conversely and interestingly, it was a huge boon to the Jews. I mean, Ben Gurion was a was a a master of turning adversity into opportunity, and when when the Arabs. Uh, when the Palestinians la launched their their strike, he saw it as a golden opportunity to, to create what he'd always want, what he had always wanted, which was a self sufficient Jewish uh, economy and a self sufficient Jewish polity. And really, by 1939, the the Jews have created um, the territorial, economic, demographic, military uh, springboard for establishing their state and for conquering uh, the, much of Palestine 10 years, uh, 10 years on. So, and as much as there was, there was a tremendous price in, in Jewish blood, you know, 500 Jews are killed in these years and many more wounded. Um, they, they come out stronger in every way. And, and, and the psychological shift, I think, is also extremely important among the Jews. There's a book about this period, an academic book called The Abandonment of Illusions. Uh, and, and the old kind of Zionist um, aspiration or hope or wish that, you know, if we just show the Arabs how many blessings we're bringing and we bring them, quote unquote, into the modern world and we, sh and we, we show them what a modern tractor is and we clear the swamps, then they'll see that this, this is a fantastic thing that we're coming and we'll all live in peace. 
Well, that illusion was uh, was was dashed in these years, um, and I think there was a, a realization among not just the Jabotinskyites, but among the mainstream Zionist uh, leadership and the rank and file that the 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 fate of this country would be determined and and maintained by force. I think there was a, a realization and an acceptance of that reality uh, in this period. In the end of your book, you basically trace uh, an overview of events that occurred uh, since the Arab Revolt and obviously after 1948. So I was wondering, are these the legacy of a great Arab Revolt? So I, I, there's there's always a risk of uh, overstating the case, right? And every 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 author and every historian who writes a book it wants to wants to convince you that nothing else matters except their book. Uh, I would <laughs> I wouldn't want to suggest that 1948 was not extremely important or 1967, but uh, the fact is there there are a lot of books on those on those particular years, uh, and I and I and I but I I, I would contend that you know the revolts uh, ripples or repercussions or echoes or cho choose your metaphor uh, have, have kind of spread throughout the conflict ever since sometimes visibly sometimes invisibly I mean I can give you just a recent example uh, in 2021 when we had the the last uh, Gaza war here you had uh, you, you had these these Twitter wars for example where <laughs> but Salil Smotrich, who of course is in the news now, he's uh, the incoming finance minister. He's he's very far right, and he's going to have uh, very significant powers in the defense ministry. But Salil Smotrich tweeted something like, uh, "Let me see if I can pull it up here." Uh, the riots of the Arab enemy take us back many years to the Great Arab Revolt, and he he goes on to talk about a worth. He he basically compares the the government of the time, the Israeli government. This is the Naftali. Uh, sorry, not Naftali Bennett. This was uh, this was pre-Bennett, wasn't it? He compares the government uh, of that uh, of that period to the British government of before, kind of a, a you know a traitorous, weak government that's kind of anti-Zionist. And then he says, neutered by now we have a worthless and weak Jewish government that's neutered by dangerous post-national and post-modern concepts. Okay, and then at the same time, on the other side, uh, Palestinians called a day-long strike. And all over the news and all over Twitter, there were comparisons to the great, the, the, the strike of 1936, right? There were, you, you had Palestinian leaders tweeting about how, you know, we're returning the glory from, from, from 1936. Um, so that's just one recent example. But I think, uh, I think in many ways, both, both, uh, both seen and unseen, uh, the, uh, you know, the, there's, uh, the, the, the revolt rages on. So, you know, there's a, there's a, 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 a cliche that the, um, I think it's a Faulkner quote that the past isn't, the past isn't, uh, how does it go? The past isn't dead. It's not even past. Uh, I think Prince Harry used that in his, in his memoirs just now, <laughs> but, uh, it's, uh, and I think that's certainly more, that's certainly true in this part of the world. And I think that, uh, that, that in, in many ways for both Israelis and Palestinians, that, that this, this revolt rages on. This was Oren Kessler, author of Palestine 1936, The Great Revolt and the Roots of the Middle East Conflict, published by Rowan and Littlefield in 2023. Oren, thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.